Welcome back to Light the Fuse, the Mission Impossible podcast for all your Mission Impossible needs. Charles, how you doing? I am great. It's our 150th episode. Happy 150th. Oh, happy 150th to you. You haven't aged a day. <laughs> Just kidding. This podcast has aged us terribly. I have definitely aged many days since we started yeah. this podcast. <laughs> We've come so far. I've had two children since we've started this podcast. Yeah, that's amazing. I have had zero children, but um, I mean, this podcast is my child in a way. Yes. Yeah. And we've rebranded our logo. Thank yes. you to the geniuses at Filmograph. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, so wherever you're listening to this, look at the logo. It is different. It is cool. Uh, it is based off of elements, I think, from three different Mission Impossible typography what is it the type is from one the spark is from another we'll get into it we're hoping to get them on for a patreon episode right that's true that's true so we're going to talk to them on the patreon which you should join which is patreon.com slash light the fuse and uh yeah there's a lot to talk about for the 150th uh there's some fun fun things to dive into you ready for this i'm ready yeah i mean we brought this up before but we've got uh well, actually, first, before first, right before I say anything, we've got the big release date shifts, of course. Yes. Um, we did a big Patreon episode about it, and uh, again, you should sign up for our Patreon to hear about this kind of stuff. But they shifted the release dates of Mission Impossible Seven and Eight to May twenty seventh, twenty twenty two, and July seventh, twenty twenty three. If you want to hear us talk all about that, you should join our Patreon. Um, we are always up on the latest news, talking on there, and we get on. We release episodes day of when those news things drop. We're really good about that. Yeah. And one of our theories turned out to be true because it looks like Tom is actually going to embark on a giant press tour for yes. Top Gun Maverick. For so. Top Gun Maverick, which is now that's now been pushed to Thanksgiving or uh, sometime in November. Yes. Uh, this year, 2021. Yeah. Check it out. Uh, but we also, as we've mentioned before, we've got big anniversaries coming up. The 15th anniversary for MI3 is coming up May 5th. And then the big one, 25th anniversary for the first mission. And Fathom Events is showing the first mission in theaters again. Yes. And this is the rundown. Mission Impossible is returning to select cinemas nationwide on May 16th, 17th, and 19th only. The theatrical event includes the film and a featurette called Mission Catching the Train. Tickets and participating locations can be found at fathomevents.com. So check that out. And we'll have more of uh, information on how you can get tickets on our social media channels, correct? Yes, and, and in our show notes as well. Yeah. So you should definitely go. We're gonna, we've got tickets for one of the screenings here in Los Angeles. We're very excited about that. I don't think we should tell anybody which one we're going to because... We're trying to be socially distanced and we don't, get, <laughs> yeah. you, we don't want a mob of people to come attack us. Oh, they're no. going to come from all angles. Yeah, yeah. everyone's going to... They'll be like, oh my God, where are the light the fuse guys? Yeah. They're going to be like, why are you eating at the subway at City Walk before your movie? <laughs> don't you... Is the Patreon no, not... Nobody will care. The last time we went to a public event was like two years ago. There was a screening at uh, the Vista, and, and, and we did have a couple people approach us. That was yes. kind of fun. Yeah. If you see us, if you see something, say something, and that something <laughs> is us. Yeah. No, I would yes, love to say hi do. to people. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll be all vaxxed up and uh, ready to hug. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about that. It'll be fun to see it on the big screen again. And there's something I know that you're probably not excited about. We're also going to do a live tweet of Mission Impossible 1 and Mission Impossible 3. Oh, I'm sick. I was si I'm was sick that day, whatever day it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work for us, so I hope you appreciate it and have fun, all of you out there. Join join us on Twitter for a live tweet of those movies. Stay tuned to our Twitter where we'll we'll announce the exact dates and times for those. All right, I had this, uh, this totally random... Uh, news item that I wanted to bring up. It's important. It's our 150th episode. I think it's important to bring up things like this. Someone sent this to us a while ago. I wish I could credit the person. I'm so sorry. They sent it to us so long ago, and I don't have who sent it to us. But William Cohen, do you know who that is? No. He was the Secretary of Defense for Bill Clinton. Okay. I'm going to pull up this. There's a, there was a news item about this. It was when the pandemic started. That's how old this news item is. And I keep kept meaning to bring it up on the show, and I kept forgetting. Someone said this to us. Former U.S. Defense Secretary William Cohen, he forgot to turn off his phone. So he forgot to turn his phone on silent before he went on someone's news program. And you know when people were doing news programs when the pandemic first started, they were just in their living room, whatever, on Zoom, just talking yes. to them. Well, William Cohen, this, the uh, Secretary of De former Secretary of Defense, had the Mission Impossible theme as his ringtone. Oh, I love that. <laughs> so he might have been, I mean, he's probably a big fan. 
And he is, like Matthew Pearl was talking about, is he Mr. Secretary? Do we need to have him on the show? Is he the real Mr. Secretary? <laughs> he could be. I now I want to try to get him on. You know, I think that would be great. Oh my God! Yes. All right. We're gonna we're gonna we gotta try to find our in. We gotta get. Yeah. We gotta get yes. I don't think I don't think our background checks would clear uh, for him to be on the show. But <laughs> oh my That's God! Great. I love that. Uh, but today we wanted a special guest for our 150th. So we got uh, we got. Uh, podcast favorite. We love this guy so much. Paul Hirsch. It was so awesome to have him back. We had to complete the trilogy. We got to complete the trilogy. This is the return of Paul Hirsch. And yeah. yeah, so excited. And he he asked us the it worked out timing wise well because he wanted to he wanted to come on the show around the time of the May the 4th, the big Star Wars celebration, um, because uh, his book is now coming to paperback. Right. What's the release date for that? It is coming out on May 4th. So the paperback comes out on actual May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. You should buy his book. It's called... A Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far, Far Away, My 50 Years Editing Hollywood Hits, Star Wars, Carrie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Mission Impossible, and more. Available in paperback on May 4th. There you go. We've got the hard covers. You can get the paperback. You know, it, it has chapters about both the first Mission Impossible and Ghost Protocol, which he also edited, and a whole lot more, as you heard. So we got him exclusively on our show to read a chapter that never was. Yes. And he still doggedly refuses to engage in our conversation about facial hair and hairstyles even though his book is 80 percent describing people's facial hair so i don't really i don't really I get that but i think i think next week we get into that with him we we uh, okay. this is a, another you know epic three-parter with paul of course so but next week we we try to we try to get him to engage he does a little bit just a little it's just a it's a weird it, it, it's at odds you know if he if there were no descriptions of hair in the book i would say okay this is this is on brand but I mean, he he describes people's facial hair and hair styles beautifully. So I don't know. <laughs> That's just one reason to read the book. It's a fabulous book. Um, yes. Yeah. But today we get you an exclusive. He reads you a chapter about Batman Forever, which is really fun. It's a good story. So uh, enjoy that. And uh, do you have some people you want to? I know it's your favorite part of the show. Yeah. I just want to say that this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Dillon and that everyone should check out his podcast, My Favorite album he talks with different musicians songwriters actors filmmakers and he has them on to talk about the music they love and how it's influenced them and their work uh, this episode is also brought to you by john b and real estate interests llc which is commercial real estate advice for growing companies if you are a company you can consult with them whether or not you're looking to buy or sell they help companies save and strategize too so please check all of those amazing people out and um please do we'll be back afterwards to wrap things up right yes enjoy kevin blumenfeld's big thank you to kevin for all of his music through our 150 episodes enjoy kevin's uh, criminal ripoff of the plot theme <laughs> We are so thrilled to be back with Paul Hirsch. Paul, how are you? How have you been this last year? We always take great pride in showing up at your doorstep and forcing our way inside your home. So this is <laughs> this is you know a big letdown for us. But how how has this past year been for you? Uh, it's been a tough year. Yeah, it's been a tough year. Yeah, but you're feeling okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. I'll take it. No, I had, you know, we had some illness and death and, you know, so tough year. Yeah. Very sorry to hear that. Did Gina tell you that we talked to her? No. Oh. Yeah, we had Gina on the show with Evan Schiff and uh, they talked, we had them talk about John Wick 3. My memory is not the greatest. <laughs> well, that's not true because you... That's have... right. You did tell me about John Wick. Yeah, yeah. So she was great. Yeah, she is great. She is great. Yeah. Yeah. She had great things to say about you, about your relationship and... Uh, she said that at a certain point she had to you you had to stop. She was she she would take advice from you, and then at a certain point it had to kind of end because it was. She, she said she said you can you you're very blunt with her. I think so. It sounds like. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm a terrible teacher. I'm a terrible really? teacher. I, I, I just uh, get out of the way. Let me do it. <laughs> I can do it better. <laughs> That's not really encouraging for young people. But she said, you know, you, you inspire her. You inspired Evan Schiff, obviously, and he's had a, a great career now. Um, yeah. So you have, you know, mentored people that have gone on and done amazing things. I have. I have. I, one, one of my uh, mentees, a uh, young guy named John Schwartz. Do you know John? No. No? Well, I don't know that his credits are, are uh, earth shattering or anything, but he's really smart. He's a good guy. And uh, he's, you know, he's, he's got a few credits to his name now. I think he's, I think he's an ace already, but anyway, he won some kind of award at ACE. I wasn't there that year at the, at the dinner where they give out the awards. And he said something about me. He said, hard to work for, but great to learn from. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll take that. That's amazing. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about John. He was in college with my son, which is how I met him. And uh, I got some kind of uh, lifetime award from some guy is a club film club out here in the Pacific Palisades. And uh, I was at, you know, a little theater we have in town. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, I'd like to work for you. And I was just starting a picture then. So I said, OK, uh, you can be the, you know, I'll hire you as an apprentice. So I got him on as an apprentice and, you know, things are going okay. And about a month later, he comes to me, he says, I'd like to ask you a favor. And I think, what? Are you kidding? <laughs> so I said, what's, what's the favor? <laughs> so he says, uh, I'd like you to recommend, uh, uh, write a recommendation for me for film school. I said, no. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Are you kidding? I said, what do, what do you want to go to film school for? This is the job you would get if you were lucky after you finish film school. <laughs> You've already got the job. What, what are you doing? What, are you, no. Are you leaving? You want to go to, you know, listen, I got 10 people, 100 people like to take your job if you don't want it, you know? So, no, I'm not going to do you a favor. I already did you a favor. I hired you. So... He goes, uh, man, it was the weekend. So he comes back on Monday. He says, listen, I wonder if we could talk. I said, no. You went, Are you staying? He said, yeah. I said, okay. <laughs> That's that. <laughs> so he never went to film school. <laughs> and now he's cutting features, you know. And uh, I said to him, you know, your father owes me a couple of hundred grand for the money that he would have spent on film school. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I think the reason you're you're the only reason you're talking to us today uh, is because your book is coming out in paperback, and we're very excited about that. And you have added is that is it a new chapter or is it just a new? Apparently, the 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 publishers uh, yeah, they don't do that. They don't change the text. Okay. A paperback version. It's just an exact copy of the original. Okay. But I had I had cut this chapter for various reasons. One of which was I was afraid that uh, Joel Schum Schumacher might sue me. Right. <laughs> but I don't have that concern anymore. And the other reason was I was a little um I was a little sensitive about the idea of Jewishness at the time. There was a lot of at the time that while we were finishing the, the text, there was a lot of tension around, you know, white supremacists uh, marching and, and all this kind of anti Semitism and Nazis shooting up Jews in synagogues in Pittsburgh and you know, there was just this feeling of and I thought, what do I want to stir this up for, you know? Right, right. So I cut it. But then I thought, it's a good story. And and maybe I could put it out as, you know, I try to get it out somehow around the time of the, uh, the book coming out just to stir up a little more interest. Okay. So it won't actually be featured in the book then? It won't be in the book. Oh, okay. So are, are we, uh, are you going to share with us the story then today? Well, what do you think? I think, you know, if I told it, it might not come off as well as the, the way I wrote it. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's a funny story about Joel Schumacher kind of being a prick. Is, is that fair to say? <laughs> well, 
to be fair, I think that, you know, it's like that story of the scorpion and the dog. I forget what the other animal is, you know. Right. The scorpion wants to get across the river. Yeah. And, you know, and he says, well, I'm not going to, st-, you know, the dog says, you're going to sting me. He says, I'm not going to sting you. Why? If I sting you, I'm going to die too. So why would I sting you? He says, yeah, okay. So they get out in the river and the, do- the scorpion stings the dog. And he says, why'd you do that? He says, I'm a scorpion. <laughs> so, you know, so Joel was just being a director and the studio was just being a studio and that's what they do. That's what they are. I mean, of course, it, it can wound you personally, but as I tell people all the time, don't take it personally. They don't consider you a person. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. You're just a slot, you know? Yeah. And this was all in relation to, uh, this is Batman Forever. When Joel Schumacher got hired to do Batman Forever, he approached you. And then there was a, the story is basically telling how you were kind of pushed out of the job in a way. I guess you're kind of forcing me to tell the story, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's a good setup. I mean, I, I think, think that, I think that you know, setup. yeah, I think we can tell people they, they should, they should read it. You know, I mean, if you want to tell it, you're welcome to. <laughs> and you never, you never worked with Joel again. No. Because did you help out on another one of his movies before this? What, he what? did Falling Down. Oh, Falling Down. That's right. Yeah, I cut Falling Down. That's right. Which is probably his best movie, so. Thank you. I'm trying to open this. Oh, here we go. So sh- should I read it? Sure. I'm sure it's, it's better to hear it in your voice than, than anyone else to say it in there, so. But you have to tell the dirty joke. The audiobook company didn't think so. I know we were so, we've had, so, I've had a, a couple people, uh, listeners to the show have said, oh, I got the audiobook and I was so disappointed that it wasn't Paul who, who read it. I wish they'd write in and say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. While I was finishing Falling Down, I was taking a walk around the Warner Brothers lot and I bumped into Joel Schumacher and his mini-me, Guy. <laughs> we were just over at your cutting room looking for you, Joel exclaimed. I said to Guy, let's play a little trick on him. What can we do? I know. And he followed with one of his trademark obscene lines that he often deployed to watch my reaction. I obliged, duly uncomfortable. (laughs) He was in a gleeful mood. Listen, I'm starting another picture, he said, and I want you to cut it. Great, I replied. What is it? Well, I just left Bob Daly and Terry Semmel, chairman and co-CEOs of Warner Brothers, And they have entrusted me with the studio's most valuable asset, he said. They want me to direct the next Batman. My heart sank. I thought the two Batman movies were among the most wretched I had ever seen, even though they made a ton of money. In addition, I didn't like the idea of doing a sequel to a picture someone else had cut. It seemed to me like taking a bath in someone else's bathwater. Great. Is there a script? I fumbled. I sensed that Joel picked up on my hesitation. Not yet. Let me read the script, I said. It sounds great, I finished lamely. Later on that evening, I thought, what am I doing? Joel only likes to hear yes. It's a high-profile movie. I should just do it. He has to make a better picture than the first two. So I called him the next day, but he had just left on a location scout on his next project based on the book by John Grisham, the client. Thinking I shouldn't let this go for long, I faxed him a letter saying, I don't know what I was thinking yesterday. Of course I'll do it. Joel called. I thought you were going to turn me down. No, no, I love working with you. And that was that. I had the job. Or so I thought. A couple of months went by, and I got a message to call Joel on the set of The Client. This was very unusual since the director has so many demands on his time during principal photography. When I got him on the phone, he said to me, are you having any problems with the studio? Not that I know of, I replied, why? Well, I had a conversation with the people in production and we were going over who I wanted as my creative team on Batman. And when I told them I wanted you, they said, we would prefer you to use someone other than Paul. I asked them why. They said, we don't want to go into it. It's simply that Just as you wouldn't want us to impose someone on you, we would prefer you didn't impose anyone on us. I was stunned. What does that mean, Joel? I don't have the job anymore? I asked. My hands are tied for the moment, but I'll see what I can do. This struck me as bullshit. If a director wants someone for his editor, he usually gets his way. I called Bruce Berman, the head of production at the studio. I couldn't get him on the phone, and he didn't return my call. 
I called my agent, Marty Bauer, and explained the situation to him. He called back a little while later. I spoke to Bruce, and here's what happened. But you can't tell anyone what he told me. It seems that Joel had just seen The Fugitive, which had just opened, and was so knocked out by the editing that he decided that he simply had to have the editor on Batman. He just made up the story about the studio so he wouldn't have to take the blame. According to the studio, Joel had lied, and they had agreed to cover his lie. But this didn't compute for me. The Fugitive was notorious around the lot. It had been cut under the most difficult conditions. They had only a few weeks to do it in and had hired six editors, all of whom shared a head credit on the film. I couldn't imagine Joel saying, I want those six people to cut my movie. It didn't make sense. It sounded to me like either they were lying or Joel was. Either way, this wasn't your garden variety white lie. It was a big, nasty, Hollywood, stab you in the back type lie. You find a knife stuck between your shoulder blades and nobody's fingerprints are on the knife. I uh, called Dee Dee Allen, who had moved back to L.A. and had taken a job at the studio similar to the position I had held under Joe Roth at Fox, although Dee Dee had a lot more power than I had. I asked Dee Dee if she knew what was going on. She said she would see what she could find out. She called me the next day. Were you slow in accepting Joel's offer to you, she asked. Well, I didn't say yes the first instant, but I wrote him the next day saying I would do it. Hmm. Yes, it seems Joel remembered that. And that's why I'm not getting the job? No, not just that. What happened is this. The Young Turks in production think that Dennis Verkler, the lead editor on The Fugitive, is a genius. They attribute the picture's success entirely to Dennis. They have given him a long-term contract here and want to pay him out of Batman's budget. They called Joel, asked him to use Dennis. Since you were a little slow to accept in the first place, Joel figured, screw Paul, and agreed to hire Dennis. This version finally had the ring of truth. They were both lying. Joel, who could have stood his ground and insisted on using me, decided to play ball with the studio and lied to cover his ass. The studio, without him knowing, blamed Joel for bouncing me. This sounded right. I called Marty Bauer to share with him what I had learned. They both were lying. Well, what do you expect, asked Marty, who, like most agents, never worried about sounding politically correct. Hollywood is the Wild West for Jews. <laughs> so, we have to ask, did you ever watch Batman Forever? <laughs> I don't know. Which one was it? <laughs> it was Val Kilmer and Jim Tommy Carrey Lee is the Jones. Riddler. Yeah. Tommy Lee Jones is Two-Face. Yeah, I, I think I saw it, but it was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> they were all horrible. Why why do you hate the you hate the Tim Burton ones a lot? The first two? I don't remember. I guess I did. I, I mean you said you they know. were dreadful in the <laughs> Yeah, you, you I think I said them wretched. wretched. Wretched, yeah. Wretched. <laughs> yeah, I, I honestly don't remember. I you know. Was it thirty years ago now? I, I've seen other things in the meantime. <laughs> well, I think the last time we were with you all the Academy screeners were coming in, and I was wondering if you watched anything this year that you really liked the yes. editing. Uh, okay, go ahead. Well, I don't know about the editing but in particular, but there were some pictures I really liked in the last year. I just saw one recently. I wrote down the name. It's the Indian Submission for a nomination in the, in the International Features uh, Division. Okay, let me look it up. And it's called Jali Katu. Okay. J A W I K A W T U. And it's about a rogue water buffalo that gets loose in a village and is laying waste to the entire village. And all the men in the village are trying to contain this water buffalo. <laughs> and it has the most extraordinary soundtrack. And the editing is extraordinary. I mean, everything about it is, is extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, the music, the sound effects, the cutting, the staging. I don't know how they shot this rampaging water buffalo. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's just, and then it's a must-see in my opinion. Wow. Then I saw a picture, a lovely little independent film called Minari. Yes. Uh, Loved it. That absolutely cliche free every time you think you know what's going to happen 
it's not what happens, you know, and it's lovely and sweet and human. And I just thought it was terrific. Charles, have you watched that yet? I haven't seen it yet. No, I had a, I have not gotten a screener of it yet. It's great. Yeah. Really liked it a lot. Yeah. What else? I saw a picture that was a year old, I guess, called Mr. Jones, directed by Agnieszka Holland. And it's about a British journalist in 1931 or two who goes to the Soviet Union to, or goes to the Ukraine to uh, investigate what's going on. You know, there's, a, there's a famine happening and, and Stalin is covering it up. And it's really, I thought, a terrific picture. So that one's kind of a lighter you know, <laughs> Friday night view. No. Yeah. Popcorn. Um, not yeah. A, it's not a great year for comedies, guys. No, <laughs> no, no. no. It seems like everyone is, is in a similar vein this past right. year. <laughs> How's how's your retirement going? Are you are you feeling like you have you gotten the itch to get back in the editing room and, and cut something? Well, I'm actually working on a little film, a little project of my own about my father. Oh, my fa my dad was a painter. He was quite well known, and his paintings are in the permanent collections of museums all over the country, including the Pet the Met, the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney. Uh, the National Gallery, the Smithsonian, uh, the Library of Congress, Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, Dallas County Museum. There's museums all over the country have pay, uh, paintings of his in their permanent collection because he was quite celebrated until the war. And he was a social realist. Uh, he was among a group of painters who painted people in their in their natural lives and also kind of progressive politically and they showed poor people and african americans and sort of portrayed the inequities that existed and still exist in american society after the war abstract expressionism came in and he was dropped the museum stopped collecting his paintings he was accused of being a communist sympathizer by a congressman from Michigan, and critics stopped reviewing his exhibitions, and he was just basically sort of abandoned by the art world. And But he kept painting the rest of his life, and uh, I just thought his talent is extraordinary. He's not uh, widely known to, I mean, I, I don't know how widely known he is, but years, many years ago, he had had an exhibition of his paintings at a, a gallery in, um, in New York on Madison Avenue. And I had just gotten into the film business and I had borrowed a 16 millimeter Bolex with a tripod. And I went to the gallery and I filmed his paintings and I panned across them. And, 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 I, had, you know, and I had intended to cut the, this stuff together and I never finished it. I got it sidetracked and it fell by the wayside. And I always regretted that I hadn't finished it. But then it occurred to me, and then, you know, of course, the negative got lost, and who, who knows where. It's just one of, my, one of my failures, one of my personal failures. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, today, I can just get on the internet and download his images and do that kind of project just using, you know, digital tools that are available, you know, to me now. So I got, um, you know, Media Composer, the Avid set up at home, and uh, I wrote a narration and I recorded it, and um, cutting together this little, it'll be a short film. However short it is, it'll probably be too long. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's a very personal thing for me. And I'm having fun doing it. That's great. It seems like you're always very hard on movies that are too long. I remember you saying things are too long, so. Yes. <laughs> My definition of a documentary is a film that's too long. <laughs> Documentaries are like history books, you know, that you do all this research and you think, well, I can't leave this out, you know? Right. <laughs> I got to put this in. 
you know, so that's what happens. I had highlighted all these passages in your book, and I was able to review them a little bit more before uh, talking today. And one, I, oh, thank you. There was one story about uh, about getting to visit Kubrick's editing room. Yes, uh, when he was doing The Shining. Yes, and you had to hide your cold from him because he was a germaphobe. Yes, I had sniffles. I was sniffling. <laughs> <laughs> so when you when you observed Kubrick in the editing room, did you see you know what was he like uh, with his editor? Or how you know what was that? What was his process? Did you get a, get a peek at that at all? Yeah, well, he was completely in charge. I mean, his editor was a guy named Ray Lovejoy, and Ray was the assistant editor on two thousand and one, who had helped Stanley uh, when they were shooting plates for the opening. You remember the opening of two thousand one of these sort of flying shots, flying over oceans and flying over deserts. And there are these long, I think in the original cut, there were like, it was like 15 minutes of this before the picture started. And, you know, he recut the picture after it opened. Yeah. Yeah, he pulled it from theaters, right? He didn't pull it, but no, he, he had Ray go to Los Angeles and they figured out a way to cut the composite print because, you know, on a composite print, the picture and track are, are a distance apart. So you have to find some place that you can make the cut that that'll sound okay and look okay. And it's kind of a tricky, a tricky thing, but they managed to do it and they figured out a place that they can make the cut and make the lift. So he flew to, um, he flew to LA from London <laughs> and he hired 30 assistant editors <laughs> and he took them one by one into the room and showed them how to make the cut. And then they flew out all over the country to every theater that was showing 2001 <laughs> and went to the projection booth and made the cut. Made the same exact cuts on each, made, on each print? Made the exact cut that he had decided on each print. Wow. Yeah. And so that was basically like you saw the movie on Wednesday night, and then if you went back the next night to see it on Thursday, it would be a different movie. They, they cut it down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the critics were, were, you know, ruthless. They were saying, this is... So it's, you know, he's lost his mind. It's so long as, you know, this and that. And right. they panned it, basically. Yeah. Brilliant work of genius, but, you know, it was too long. So there's a real danger being too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so he was, Ray was working for Stanley, collecting these plates as an assistant editor. And he'd worked for him for about six months when they were getting ready to start the picture. Stanley said, Ray, how would you like to cut the picture? He said, okay. So his first movie was 2001. Wow. <laughs> but but uh, Stanley was using a, uh, a video editing setup. It was the first I'd ever heard of. And um, we went to his cutting room and uh, just racks and racks of film. And there was a clearing. Uh, the, the, the cam where Ray was working was sort of over to the side and uh, Stanley was on in sort of in the center of the room, and he had a monitor, and he had an addressable Betamax, meaning that it was not the standard one that you could buy it uh, commercially, but with the one that he had, he could put in a number, and the tape would wind down automatically to that footage. And then he had these notebooks, where some army of assistant editors or something had noted down. The, foot, the, the cassette number and the footage for every single line of dialogue in the film. So he could see, he could compare line readings uh, of any given line by simply winding down to it automatically with, with the uh, videotape. So this is much faster than, you know, pulling out another roll of film, threading it up, rolling down to it, and saying, no, that's no good. Right. And then, you know repeat the process. So this was a big, a big advance. So that's what he was doing. So he would, he would sit there at the cassette and he would figure out what he wanted to go to next. And he would compare line readings and he'd figure out which one he wanted. And he would call it out to the assistant editor who'd go to the rack, get the film, bring it over to Ray. Ray would cut it in while Stanley was looking for the next piece he wanted to use. So that's how it worked. And Stanley was, you know, Stanley was essentially cutting the picture, but I always felt that Stanley needed an editor, you know. I suppose if I cared to, I could, I could, you know, burn one of his pictures and tighten it up, which I always wanted to do. I'd, but, I'd love to see uh, that. I'd love to see what you do. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
We'll have to wait to see if I get really bored in the last minute. Paul so much yes and it's great that we've, we've talked to Gina now too so we're we're we've talked to the whole well not the whole family but we've talked to two members of the family really great stuff talent obviously runs in the family so yeah really really fun yeah I mean there's so much so many things to talk about he mentioned that movie Jelly Katu at least as of, as of this recording is currently on Amazon Prime and uh, I actually watched it it's a pretty crazy movie it's uh, worth a watch. You can see this, the editing is really, really fun and, and uh, innovative and sharp. It's cool. So I, I can see why Paul loved it. Uh, I also have now seen Minari, finally, and that I can confirm that movie is really great. That was another one he recommended. And then the other movie he mentioned, Mr. Jones, I haven't watched it yet, but it's uh, it features the White Widow herself, Vanessa Kirby, and it's uh, currently on Hulu. There you go. At least for now. Yeah. What What else? Do you have anything you wanted to bring up? Well, I just, I mean, there were so many fun things. He, t- he talked about hiding his cold from Stanley Kubrick in the editing room. <laughs> that was pretty fun. And uh, and how they, how Kubrick re-edited 2001 after it went to theaters, which I had never heard that full story about how that went down. I heard that he, you know, I thought he had pulled the prints and done it, but they actually sent out different people to make the cuts on the actual prints. That's crazy. Didn't Malik do that too with um, New World? Oh, did he? Yeah, I think the new world that premiered in New York and L.A. was different than the one that went across all around the country. I think that all there, like I think Malik. there's two or yeah, there's two or three cuts on the Criterion one. But yes, yeah, so there's three there's three cuts on that my Criterion release. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and then also he talked about how he wanted uh, Paul Hirsch talked about how he wanted to re-edit some Kubrick movies. <laughs> Never satisfied. <laughs> I want. I want to see. I would love to see a Paul Hirsch edit of uh, of some of. I mean, I, I think Kubrick's movies are, you know, most of them are fucking masterpieces. But I'd love to see what Paul Hirsch would do. Why not? I mean, it's a, it's always fascinating when Steven Soderbergh does a a re edit of movies and stuff. It's pretty fun. So I'd be, I'd be down to see what 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 Paul Hirsch is going to do. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. And it was cool to hear the Batman Forever chapter. Yeah, it's an exclusive for all of you out there. Definitely pick up Paul's book. Uh, again, the title is. A long time ago in a cutting room far, far away. My 50 years editing Hollywood hits, Star Wars, Carrie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Mission Impossible, and more. Available in hardcover, paperback, audiobook, and Kindle. Yeah, I wish the paper, I wish the audiobook was, was, was Paul's voice, but that's okay. It's okay. It? It's still great. Who is it? I don't know, but we, we talked to Paul a little bit about that. I don't know if that was this week or another week, but... Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, definitely get Paul's book. It's awesome. If you have any interest in film filmmaking, uh, and he's so funny too. So it's, it's a great read. And you have some shout outs to give too, don't you? Yes, I do. Actually. I want to give a, a special thank you to Jacob from Holland and Eddie Santos. Thank you to Jacob and Eddie for making this episode possible. I also want to credit our production assistant, Abby Smith, and our editor and mixer, Luke Burson, and of course, our music by Kevin Blumenfeld. And a big thank you to everybody who's helped us get to 150. Hopefully, we'll get another 150. I hope so. I mean, they push the movies back any more than, yeah, we're definitely going to get to 100, 550. I mean, when when is our 200th? Because didn't McCory promise us Cruise on our 200th? Let's hope. I don't know. That would be another year from now. All right. So maybe it'll be around the time of MI7. Let's hope. All right. Fingers crossed. Uh, we'll be back next week with the second part of our Paul Hirsch trilogy. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcast at gmail.com. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.